The last paragraph, the Spirit gave early Christian believers the conviction that their sins had been forgiven, thus they were not fearful in the judgment. I just want to point out, this conviction of having our sins forgiven is an important experience to have as we come to Christ. The natural impact of sin upon heart, mind, and soul of the sinner, the natural consequence of sin is guilt, shame, internal condemnation, and fear. Fear of punishment, fear of rejection. That's what sin causes in the sinner. I'm no good. We deserve punishment. This is what sin it warps us. It warps our thinking and our feelings. And we project that out of ourselves back onto God. And we're convinced that God sees us the way sin has caused us to see us. We don't deserve his love. We're horrible. We're worms. We're corrupt. We're terrible. We deserve punishment. This is what sin causes. And therefore, we view God as angry and wrathful and, and uh, mad and, and that justice requires that he act out against us. And we create theologies to hide and protect us. And so in the salvation process, it's absolutely important that the sinner hear that God forgives and know that God is not against them. They must know that. And it's joyful to experience the conviction of the Spirit that you are forgiven of God. Isn't it joyful to have that peace? Yes. So God meets the sinner in their place of fear and condemnation, in their place of guilt and shame, and communicates that we're forgiven. That's what he said to the, the, the paralytic who was paralyzed, but his primary concern wasn't about walking. He met him there and said, your sins are forgiven. Oh, what peace and joy filled his soul. But understand, the barrier, the obstacle to our unity with God is not from God. There is nothing in God that keeps us separate from him. There is no anger, there's no wrath, there's no unforgiving attitude. Nothing in God blocks our approach to God. Nothing. God needed nothing done to him. The obstacle to our reconciliation with God is sin in us. That's the obstacle. That's the blockade. It's our fear. It's our guilt. It's our shame. It's our preference for lies and self-centeredness. That's the obstacle. There's no obstacle in God. He does not bar the way. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish with everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Notice the purpose, not for condemnation's sake. There was never a, a, a condemnation. It was to save and then continuing. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe him stands condemned already. Already. Because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Romans, this was, uh, this was John 3, 16 to 18. Romans 8, 1 or 8, 31? No yeah, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. But those who are not in Christ Jesus stand condemned already by their sin condition. Born in sin, conceived in iniquity. We are not born... In legal trouble, we're born in lethal trouble. We have a terminal condition, dead in trespass and sin. But Christianity, in fact, with a false law view, has understood that we're born in legal trouble and God is angry and God is wrathful and something has to be done to God to remove the barrier from God's side. Understand this is taught in all circles of Christianity, including Adventist Christianity, and it's fraudulent, it's false, it distorts God's character. If you want to read about it, there's a book published by the Reed called The Cross of Christ, written by a bunch of theologians, and it was used as a, as a template text to oppose our class. And in that, it says specifically that nowhere in the Bible does it say that um, God had to be reconciled to man. It only teaches that man had to be reconciled to God. It says that. But then it goes on to say, but, um, but the barrier to sin had to be removed from both man and God says it in the book, even though they acknowledge the Bible doesn't teach it. 
in spite of this fact. They go, but in spite of this fact, in spite of what the Bible teaches, we know better. Because of the premise of the imposed law construct, which is a lie. A 19th century evangelist, evangelist George MacDonald wrote the following. And it's uh, in a book called Discovering the Character of God. What a good title. It says, The Lord never came to deliver men from the consequences of their sins while those sins yet remain. It's like saying, uh, The doctor never came to relieve people from the fever and, and cough that they have while the pneumonia still remains. You see, that's very, that's very sensible. Exactly correct. Okay? Yet feeling nothing of the dread hatefulness of their sin, men have constantly taken the word that the Lord came to deliver us from our sins to mean that he came to save us from the punishment of the sins. This idea has terribly corrupted the preaching of the gospel. The message of the good news has not been communicated, unable to believe in the forgiveness of the Father in heaven. Imagining him not at liberty to forgive or incapable of forgiving forthright. Not really believing him, God, who was fully our Savior, but a God bound, either in his own nature or by a law above him and compulsory upon him, to exact some recompense or satisfaction for sin, meaning that he's required to punish. This is Satan's life in the beginning. Continuing on. A multitude of religious teachers have taught their fellow men that Jesus came to bear the, our punishment and save us from hell. But in that, they have misrepresented his true mission. Exactly correct. God forgave us freely. There was never an unforgiving attitude on God's part. The barrier to our reconciliation with God has never been on God's side. Nothing had to be done to God or God's law. Everything had to be done in humanity to remove sin from the mind, heart, character of human beings so that we could live in God's presence again. That's the plan of salvation. Salvation. 